you for anybody who doesn't know who Tim is. Tim Frick is the owner of Mighty Bytes, a digital company that builds creative and technical solutions to help nonprofits and conscious companies grow and thrive. Mighty Bytes is a certified Illinois B Corp and one of Illinois' first benefit corp corporations. The company is committed to solving social and environmental problems with its work and is a leader in sustainable web design. Tim is also the author of books on media and marketing, including Designing for Sustainability, A Guide to Creating Greener Digital Products and Services, which is going to be released later this year, the summer of 2016, uh, by O'Reilly Media. So without further ado, let me hand the stage over to you, Tim, and you can get started. Okay, so your mic should be on now. Okay, everybody can hear me? Yes, and we can see and your slides. Yeah, you can see my slides. That's Excellent. awesome. Thank you very much for the great introduction, and, and to all the speakers here, the, these presentations have just been really inspiring and, and exciting to, to see uh, a community come together like this. So um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of the practicality of, of taking some of these things that we're talking about today and, and turning them into actionable business practices. Um, you know, we every, I think everybody that's attending has, has read some of the kind of mind-boggling stats that uh, we've been bouncing around today. And um, I know that when we did, uh, we really started thinking of, that we were, you know, kind of more part of a prob the problem than we were the solution a few years ago. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today was just kind of how, you know, freelancers and agencies can start thinking about designing for sustainability um, as, as in, you know, something that they do in their everyday, everyday work. Um, for us, this started when we became a certified B Corp. Um, as, as Jen mentioned in the intro, um, Mighty Bytes has been a certified B Corp since 2011. And what that is, is uh, B Corps use the power of business to solve social and environmental problems. Andrew's company, Man Overboard, is a B Corp. And Mike, the guy who's going after me, his company, Open Concept Consulting, are also B Corps. Um, so each company uses the power of business to solve social and environmental problems in their own unique way. And we do that using a tool called the B Impact Assessment. Um, and what that is, is it's an online assessment that uh, that's pretty rigorous and it takes you through the process of building a roadmap to creating a more conscious and sustainable and socially conscious and, and environmentally conscious company. Um, and it also kind of gamifies that process so that when you are done taking the assessment for the first time, you have this great, you know, kind of blueprint or to-do list that you can use over time to get better and better and better. And so you get a score and, you know, that score kind of serves as the first benchmark for you to constantly improve, et cetera. And so many of those questions in the B, B Corp assessment are about supply chain, which in 2011 was something that I knew very little about. We had gone through a, a kind of an environmental impact assessment through our local um, neighborhood association, and so we knew about, you know, recycling and LED light bulbs and stuff like that, but, you know, we didn't know a ton about supply chain, and, and honestly, I thought since we were a, you know, web design and software firm that we, you know, really only had pixels and people in terms of, of what our supply chain actually entailed, um, and so we thought, you know, we were pretty pretty green, um, and, and as we went through the B Impact Assessment for the first time, you know, performed really well in the in the environmental uh, area, but but not so well in some of the other areas. Um, and supply chain was one of those things where we were like, hmm, how do we how do we figure out how to, how to do this? Um, so if you want a little bit more information uh, on on B Corps, you can go to B Corp B .net. I bring this up because it was the impetus for me, uh, kind of looking internally at our company and figuring out how we can do something about this issue that we've all been talking about today. Um, and I'm not going to belabor a lot of the statistics, but one of the big ones that that uh, came out in 2000. 14, um, as we were kind of going through our, our kind of education process on all of this, uh, was that if the internet were a country, it would be the sixth largest user of electricity in the world, behind China, U.S., Japan, India, and Russia. And so, you know, we were kind of like, oh, well, maybe we're part of bigger part of the problem than we thought we were, especially since only 13% of our energy here in the U.S. Um, comes from renewable sources. So, you know, we really started to kind of have our eyes opened out, you know, how our online activity was was kind of in having an environmental impact. Um, so we decided to sit down as a company and define 
a series of practices that would help us, you know, kind of figure out way to, where to go on this. Um, as I think uh, James mentioned and a couple other the pre presenters mentioned earlier, rotating carousels and retina images and video backgrounds and all that kind of stuff have sent the average web page, you know, careening up into the two to two and a half megabyte uh, um, uh, size. And so, you know, that frustrates users, that wastes energy, and we want to be part of the solution and not the problem. And so we sat down on this, you know, started down this journey to figure out how to create more sustainable digital products and services. So w what we did um, basically ran into two or fell into kind of two categories. One was on the efficiency side, which is a lot of what James was talking about today on, on the front end user experience side. Um, and then the other part for us was renewable energy. We wanted to make sure that at the source of this problem is the fact that so much of the energy that we that powers the internet comes from you know fossil fuels and non-renewable sources. So we wanted to make sure that was part of our process going forward. And so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, is how that wasn't as easy of a of a road uh, to towards green energy as we thought it might be. Um, so the point of, of this uh, in, in the you know fish, creating the efficiency of the product and service itself, and then the processes that we use to make those products and services, getting them powered rate by renewable energy, um, and in doing so, um, oops, go back up. Uh, there's a there's a, a, a SAP study that says uh, 7.6 gigabytes of tar carbon can be mitigated just by transferring digital business processes to to, or, or excuse me, existing business processes to digital and then driving decisions with data um, in just six industries. Um, so that's pretty pretty major. In other words, if you're taking, you know, b basic business processes and turning them over to soft, turning them into software, you know, up to, in just six in industries, up to seven and a half or plus seven and a half gigatons of carbon can be mitigated. Um, but what that study uh, didn't take into consideration was that all of that, um, all of that stuff is still going to need to be powered by electricity, and all of those, you know, the, the pixels there are st are still need need electricity, and that all of that stuff is still going to need to be as efficient as possible. Um, so, so I think it's one area that we're not necessarily focusing a lot on uh, when it comes to the the, the products that we build. Um, and so this is one of the areas that we wanted to uh, focus on for our own work. Um, so we focused our work in four areas, um, findability, usability, performance optimization, and then in green hosting. Um, and they kind of became the cornerstones of the work that we were doing. And, and as some, several of the presenters have mentioned before, uh, you know, many of the best practices here are really just good practices overall, um, but we wanted to make sure that they were couched in terms of sustainability and efficiency, so, so that when we're going, talking about front-end user experience stuff and content strategy, that we're making sure they're as efficient as possible. So we started building websites this way and, and products this way in about 2013. So it took us about a year and a half to kind of get through um, and, 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 and create a new process. And, and we're still constantly iterating that process. I think a big part of this, um, as I believe Sam was talking about earlier, is this you know, idea of agility and constant iteration. That's definitely a part of, of what we do. And so we're always tweaking and finessing to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible in what we're building. So um, let's talk about findability. Um, how quickly can people find your content and the content, or your website and the content on it? That is really kind of the the the, t the main part of what we wanted to do with, with findability. Content strategy and good content strategy is a great part of that, but so does like, you know, search engine strategy and, and, and optimizing a page so that it can be easily crawled by search engines. So some of the questions that we typically add, ask ourselves um, on these things is, you know, how does a site perform in the search engines? Uh, you know, are the pages on it optimized for search engine crawls? And then if, if so, what's our, what's our strategy for increasing the page or dom domain authority of those pages so that they, you know, can increasingly be found by search engines faster. Um, and of course, obviously, a big part of that is, is really good, solid content, um, and and making sure that that content content is concise and to the point, and that the calls to action of that content are clear. Um, making sure that the navigation is obvious and clearly labeled, um, and then also making sure that the site itself has search. Um, one you know, a, a one big part of finding content is that if you're on a site and you know that it's a site has something that you want, being able to very quickly search that site across platforms and devices. 
Um, for us, the process, what that means meant to our process was to start incorporating things like content patterns and, and lean and agile methodologies and making sure that um, there's constant iterative collaboration between content strategists, d developers, and designers. Um, and so they're just making sure that there was that, uh, that iteration always happening and that there was regular collaboration. And I should add also with our clients, we're an agency, uh, you know, agency-based model. So we make sure that our, our process is grounded in collaboration with our clients as well as with each other. Um, in terms of usability, um, you know, we ask ourselves the obvious question, how can users accomplish tasks across devices and platforms most quickly? That's obviously something everybody here at this conference is, is asking themselves as well. Um, and then in terms of, of, of that, you know, there's a certain amount of, of optimization that ha can ha happen on the design front. Uh, in, as James was saying, using CSS sprites, using SVG and vector images over pixels, uh, you know, compressing your pixel images down using some of the, uh, the like Kraken.io and stuff like that. And then something that um, uh, Pete uh, Markowitz, who presented this morning, brought up not too long ago, using print style sheets, which I think, uh, you know, not everybody thinks about a lot, but when you think about if someone goes to your, your website, um, and, and, you know, tries to print it out and it's not optimized for being printed, then they're going to waste a lot of paper trying to get a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff out of it. So I, I thought Pete brought that up on his blog a couple months ago and I thought that was a really, really great thing that not a lot of people are thinking about because we're always thinking in terms of, of digital. And so for our, our own process on, in terms of this, we made sure that we're, you know, creating lean personas. We're doing things like tree testing and, and using uh, tools like Optimizely to make sure that we're using that constant iteration. Um, we're doing pattern or component-based design rather than design comps, so we don't do design comps anymore. Um, and then we're, again, making sure that our design and development teams are in constant collaboration. And then in terms of uh, performance optimization, the third part of, of this uh, process, um, we, you know, we just want to make sure, again, per what uh, James was just saying a couple presentations ago, the site is speedy and reliable for all the reasons he mentioned in terms of, you know, if it's an e-commerce site, there could be lost income um, and that users will abandon a site that it doesn't load in, you know, just a couple seconds. So uh, like James, we actually, I found out about the idea of a page weight budget from James. Um, and so, you know, defining what the smallest possible page weight based on a target user profile could be is a great way to, to go about that and, and talk about you know what what the pros and cons are and what the trade-offs are of saying okay we have this page budget budget and we want to stick to it um, and then you know there's basic stuff like following the Google and Yahoo performance guidelines making sure that scripts are minified you know breaking keeping HTTP requests down etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then uh, again going back to those lean agile methods for collaboration so that uh, uh, that all of this stuff is tested and, and, and optimized as much as possible and finally, uh, uh, the fourth cornerstone of kind of what we've put in of our process, which I think has been the most challenging for us, um, has been green hosting. Um, so, you know, the question we ask is, you know, can we get the site hosted by 100% renewable energy? Um, and originally that seemed like it was going to be easy. And, and um, so when we embarked on this journey back in 2011-12, um, you know, we, they, we found green hosts out there. Um, and so we were like, great, this is going to be easy. Um, and as we dug a little bit deeper into it, you know, we found out that it's not quite the simple process that we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you want renewable energy power to be, you know, as close to the source as possible. So if, if possible, you know, can, can the data center have a solar array on its rooftop or can it be powered by a nearby, you know, nearby uh, wind, wind farm or something like that um, versus renewable energy credits which the market has driven down in price and can in potentially be not as useful because of the fact that they some of them the some of the lower cost recs don't actually push the generation of renewable energy forward um, but rather are just kind of being optimized for price um, so you know looking looking deeper into those when we started looking you know finding out about this it took us a while to figure out the difference between on-site renewables and recs and, and and all of that kind of stuff and when we uh, use hosting providers that use renewable energy credits we want to make sure that those 
providers fund projects to push renewable energy production forward. And so that's a really important thing as you go to choose. Um, these are some of the companies that we worked with um, in, in going through this process and figuring out like how, how, how to power our websites and the websites we build for clients with renewable energy. Um, we've tried probably about twice as many as those on this list. Um, sadly, we've abandoned all of them. Um, and, and some smaller unknowns as well as the, the ones that are kind of popular here. Um, mostly we ditched them because of poor customer service and a lack of reliability. So that was a really incredibly big deal for us. Like we were really excited to say we could power our, our, our digital products and services with renewable energy. But when you make that kind of referral to a client and the client says, great, I'll go do this, and then their website goes down for three days, that's a reflection on you. And so we had it happen not only with our own products and services, but we had it happen with, with uh, client projects as well. And it just turned into such a huge ongoing headache. And we couldn't figure out like why we would go from one to the next to the next to the next and have the same um, same issues happen. And then lo and behold, we I discovered just a few weeks ago actually um, this company called Endurance International Group. Um, so this is a company uh, that owns 60 plus hosting brands. So um, they 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 Bluehost and and Hostgator and and Site Five and, and a lot of the popular hosting brands. Um, are all owned by this large conglomerate called Endurance International Group, which is a public company. And the law in the United States says that a public company has to maximize shareholder value. And so the shareholders can say, you need to optimize for profit no matter what. And so Endurance is a great example of how they do this in our industry. Um, so they own 60 plus hosting brands. Um, and what, what they do, from what I can understand, there's tons of things out on the internet about, about complaining about this company. Um, you know, they're like, HostGator is a perfect example. Small company, wanted to power themselves with renewables. They went down the, pr the process um, and, and, and they became a green host. And then as soon as they were pr pr purchased by Endurance International Group, you can't find anything new about their hosting, their green hosting. So it's really hard to know whether or not they actually truly are a green host if they're continuing along that, along those lines, um, and or not. And and I think of even more important uh, to this endurance international group thing, EIG. Um, you know, there's no transparency. So what happens? You know, they, this company is notorious, and its brands are notorious for being you know, crappy hosts where the sites go down and they offer poor customer service. But what happens is the customers leave one of them out of frustration and because they own 60 hosting providers, they go right to another one and don't realize that they're still working with EIG. Um, so the cycle starts all over again. And so, you know, for us, we didn't realize that we were bouncing basically from one to another to another uh, in the interest of hosting our web properties with, you know, renewable energy. Um, and, and only really just going with the same company because they weren't weren't very transparent about all of this. So the cycle would start over and over. So it was really like a you know an ongoing multi-year effort for us to find the perfect solution. What we ended up doing um, is we found another uh, uh, B Corp called Greenhouse Data, um, and they have eight data centers here in the United States. Um, and uh, we partnered up with them to offer green hosting of our own. So basically, we white labeled their service. So um, you know we have a, a dedicated provider with customer service and support that we can call on whenever we need it. Um, but we are able to manage the kind of hosting hosting provider area and for our clients and stuff. So that has ended up being a, a much better uh, route for us. Um, but it sure was a long ass way to get there, I have to say. And learning this new information about EIG was really kind of you know eye opening to say, oh, well, that makes total sense there. So anyway, moving forward, um, you know, now we're in this kind of happier place where we're able to help our clients and, and, and the products that we build with uh, renewable energy. We also realized as we're going through this that when we would talk about it to clients and to other web designers and web teams, that they they weren't really even aware that this was a thing. Like that, 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 that you know, they thought of the internet as a green medium because it replaces paper. So why wouldn't it be? Um, and so we realized that awareness was a big hurdle of, of the issue um, and, 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 you know, everything that was kind of comes around that. I mean, it's not quite as challenging as convincing the fossil fuel companies to leave oil in the ground, but it's pretty, pretty damn challenging, um, especially for a small little web design firm in Chicago. Um, so one of the things we wanted to, to do was, was help 
people understand, you know, what the Im potential impact of their of their of their own site is. Um, and we originally set out to create a formula for estimating actual website emissions, but as Pete noted this morning and a couple of the other presenters, that's pretty complicated. There's a lot of moving parts there and a lot of things, and so we realized that was not within the scope of something that we could do. Um, but we could certainly build something that would help people better understand um, their, 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 the impact of their own digital properties. So we built this thing that, uh, thank you very much, a couple of other uh, presenters this morning has call, uh, mentioned called EcoGrader. And so the idea here was to make a simple website crawler um, that can give people a general understanding of what it is that their website is doing, where it can be made more efficient, and whether or not it's powered by renewable energy. Um, to do this, we used APIs from Google. We used the PageSpeed Insights API. We used Moz, which is an SEO uh, platform. And then we also used the Green Web Foundation. They've been incredibly helpful um, in, 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 in helping us figure out how to grade you know, renewable energy in, in that whole Rex versus, versus uh, direct access to renewables. Um, we were in inspired by HubSpot's website grader. That was kind of the thing. We wanted it to be super simple and super easy, um, and that you just put your URL in and go. And then when you do that, um, you basically get a, a nice little you know, handy-dandy report that gives you a breakdown of like, hey, this is a particularly good, um, well-performing site, uh, ID Action Corp, or another B Corp. Um, and we specifically built their site with this criteria in mind so that we could get them a, a score in the 90s. Um, and so we worked through the entire process of building site with them to make sure that the site was lean and fast and, um, you know, had, had, had a, 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 as good of a, a Moz rank as it, we could get, that it used shared resources, minimized HTTP requests, HTTP requests, et cetera. Um, and then we got them hooked up with the green web host. Um, so that was kind of using EcoGrader as a benchmarking thing for to help a client go through the process. For other people uh, who just want to, you know, quickly get a report, uh, EcoGrader gives a lot of great uh, breakdowns. I, I guess I, mean, I might be a little biased in calling them great, but I mean they're basically breakdowns in 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 how you can go about improving your site. For the average website owner who doesn't have a, a design or development team at their hands, um, it might be a little bit uh, uh, overwhelming for some of the things. But at least they have the report; they they can link to it, and they can you know get a, they can hand it off to to a web designer and say, "Look, I want to do these things to my site," so they can get a better understanding, and they can you know help a, a web designer easily do that. So that was one awareness thing was building EcoGrader. We did that in 2013. Um, we've made tweaks to it since we built it, and we're going to give it an entire redesign uh, starting uh, this summer, maybe launch this summer. Another thing that we did is we started blogging incessantly about all of this. Um, I think we've got 30, 30 to 40 blog posts um, uh, on, on the Mighty Bytes website, and so we took the best of those and we put them all in sustainablewebdesign.org. Um, and so the idea being that it would be, you know, it would it would attract people searching for this, um, but also then in turn also give uh, good practices for for how to create your own, you know, more more conscious and more sustainable web pages. And then finally, on the awareness front for us, um, I've been neck deep for the last few months working on a new book called Designing for Sustainability. Um, it's in advanced release. Uh, it comes out on Monday, actually, as an e-book. Uh, O'Reilly does these really great things where they they uh, put it out as, as an e-book, e and then the community can give feedback to it on, on the actual book, um, which is super helpful. Um, so it'll come out on Monday, and then over the next few months, I will get some feedback from readers and be able to continuously and iteratively improve the, the content, which is pretty awesome. Um, and it's got uh, a lot. Everything in this presentation is covered, um, but it also includes interviews with about two dozen design and sustainability experts, um, including four of the presenters at this conference and over a dozen B Corps. Um, so I've been, like I said, working hard on that, and it's been really rewarding to see other organizations and companies and educators uh, focusing on this and, and doing something about it. So, uh, simple things that, that we can do in, in this community um, without having to go, you know, and, and, and design, you know, focus on, on, on website processes. There are simple advocacy things that you can do. Um, you know, getting all companies that house data centers to commit to renewable energy is a pretty massive undertaking. Um, but there are, you know, simple things like pressuring uh, companies that are not using renewables to start using renewables. Um, and some of those companies are here uh, on this page. Amazon. Web
web services, uh, as James was cough coughing and mentioning earlier before, houses a lot of a lot of other sites that we use like Dropbox and Vine and Yelp and all, all that good stuff. Green America and Green Beast, Greenpeace uh, both have Amazon cam campaigns out there. I think a quick little Google search would get you to those campaigns, and you can sign up and learn more. Greenpeace has made little teeny baby steps forward, um, and it's getting very successful. Excuse me, with Amazon, um, and Amazon has made those baby steps forward. Um, but there's, they still have a ways, a ways to go. Um, and then, you know, the other quick thing is to to find a hosting provider. Canvas Host is a, a B Corp provider. Greenhouse Data, which I mentioned earlier, is not a website uh, hosting provider. They they don't uh, you can't sign just anyone up. Um, they you can white label their service if you want to be your own hosting provider. But Canvas Host is another B Corp that uh, is a green provider, and they they can house your websites there. Um, there's a green hosting position uh, petition uh, that w that we put out. There's a couple of us B Corps working on trying to define standards for green hosting so that what happened to Mighty Bytes over the past few years doesn't happen over and over and over. Uh, we want to make sure that there are some kind of easy to understand standards for people. Um, so if you go to bit.ly slash green hosts, there's a petition there. Please consider signing it. We're going to take the community that we build from this and eventually try to get some standards for better green hosting out there in the world. Um, and uh, finally, I just you know want to bring out that the root of this problem lies in the source of the internet's power. Um, and efficiency is great, and, and it's and, and and obviously a big part of what we're talking about today is is really great, uh, is really based on focused on efficiency of of the user experience. Um, but the reality is, you know, J Javon's paradox was brought up a couple times this morning. Um, people are always going to share cat videos, always, and so making sure that um, you know we are sourcing. Our, our, our power from renewable sources uh, is, is really where we want to get to. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the, as James was talking about earlier, the 1 billion or so uh, tons of CO2 you know, is about 1 35th of what we use as humans each year, or what we uh, uh, produce as humans each year. So um, some of these simple choices are easy ways to make, um, you know, make, make sustainable choices and, and move the needle forward. And so I'm hoping that this community here can help us you know, help move together, work together, move together, and 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 get this get things changing. Um, and I'm a few minutes early, but that's that's what I got right now. Um, I can close down and and look at uh, the Slack channel for questions. Um, and uh, you know, happy to ta happy to take those if anybody has. Thank you so much, Tim. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That will never get old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James, <laughs> for providing the applause. <laughs> um, I was going to say I can take a look at Slack and see if there are any questions in there um, to feed to you here because we do have a little time. You can hang out on the air, but I'm not seeing any right this minute. Um, but we can hang out. Uh, the next talk is slated for 3 o'clock, our, our final talk at 3 o'clock. So um, we've got about 8 minutes or so. And uh, we can hang out here. But I want to thank you again, Tim. Great sure, talk. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks very much to everybody. Question. What was that discount code again? I assume for the, uh, the book, right? There we go. Let's, uh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Smart. I'll just leave that up there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it can be used basically from here forward at all. Um, the way that O'Reilly explained it to me is that if you uh, use by the final release, which comes out in July, it'll give you 40% off of that. Um, if you buy the advanced release and you decide you want to get into that whole kind of like crowdsourcing of the editing process, that it will give you 50% off.